Uh, just a little disclaimer, CouchDB in itself has nothing to do with Ruby, and I'm not even a Ruby guy, I'm a PHP MySQL web development person, and so I might have the odd job presentation here, but I'm glad you all showed up, and uh, uh, there's a question. Yeah, I can do that, sorry. Maybe, this, okay. So, um, there, there's neat things you can do with Ruby and CouchDB, but there's not inherently, uh, the topic of, of um, Ruby is not inherently embedded in CouchDB or somehow, so uh, I hope you like the talk anyway. Um, uh, my name is Jan Lehnert, I'm from Germany, which you probably can tell from my accent. Um, I'm a web developer, like I said, doing PHP MySQL, and I tend to keep an eye off, uh, on emerging technology. Uh, that's how I came about CouchDB, because I thought that would be, well, if I had something like CouchDB, that would really, really make my life easy as a web developer. So that's how I got started with the project, and now I'm a, I'm a, like, a contributor to the project and help, uh, help to, to get the project along. That's me. me. Uh, the basic premise of my talk is CouchDB is an easy database, and it's easy on two accounts. The first one, it is easy to understand. There's not much magic going on. Uh, the concepts behind it are not very, no, not, not that strange, or you can easily approach CouchDB. The second, or uh, even may, maybe three things. Uh, the second one is the, the way to use CouchDB, the actual programming with CouchDB is relatively simple, so that new uh, pro programmers who are not that like, experienced um, can can easily get into the world of CouchDB. And the third uh, one is if you're into like look over an application lifetime, the demands for a de database usually change. In in the beginning, it should be easy to to program against it and, and use it. And when well, you have a mature appli uh, application, you usually want your database to be easily maintainable. Uh, it should be scalable and all these things. And CouchDB makes that easy as well. So CouchDB is from like top to bottom an easy database, <laughs> sort of. Um, and first off, CouchDB is not a relational database. So when people say database, they usually mean relational database. CouchDB is not a relational database. Um, uh, what CouchDB does is it takes no. What do you, how do I get with that? Um, what you usually do when you write an application is um, you have some sort of data model that you need to, um, where you go and help take your, your, the data objects you have in your application and you split them up into different tables and design joins and queries and all this. And there's, there's a, lot of, a whole lot of things going on before you actually start writing an application that is just the data storage layer. And in the end, you just want to store data and get it back somehow. And uh, there needs to be, like, if you want to, like, future proof and all that, you need to be really careful to do things right from the beginning, and um, that's like a whole lot of work to do. Um, and CouchDB tries to, to e make that easier. Um, CouchDB has this, or introduces the concept of a document. And a document is like the things we have in the real world, a business card, a bill, or a receipt we get. And with these documents, they, um, they have like they are structured. Like we have uh, all of, uh, we all, have, well, most of us have business cards, and they, there's a telephone field, an email field. Um, so there's it's, there's the same information on it. But there might be, oh, I don't have a fax. You might have a fax. I don't have an office address on my uh, business card, and you you might have. And it's still both things are, are business cards, but they are differently structured. And the same is with the uh, receipts you get from 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 restaurants or from when where you buy things. For each shop you go to, it will look the same or similar, but for each uh, for the, the different shops will have differently structured um, receipts or bills or whatever. And if you would want to build a, like a financial overview um, application that that will have you, you can analyze your spending or whatever, you, need, you will need to come up with a schema that accommodates all these different um, these different structures of all these documents there, and. Uh, this is kind of hard. So CouchDB takes these uh, concept of semi-structured data and lets you store just as is, uh, as, as, it, as it occurs in the real world or in your application, uh, and store that into CouchDB without the need to create a schema up front. You, there's, there's, just, there's no predefined structure. You just have a data object and store it into CouchDB. 
uh, how does it technically work. Uh, we use or catch to be used as JSON. It's a JavaScript object notation. It obviously comes from the JavaScript language, but it's since evolved to be like available everywhere. And what it <clears throat> what it basically does is you can ha you have an object in your in your programming language, a native object with I don't know all, all the all the the native types uh, like uh, numbers, strings, arrays, or another object inside of there, and you can serialize that into a string representation of that object. And you do that, that and store this string representation, this JSON string, into CouchDB. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, then <coughs> um, you can get this string representation back and deserialize it into, again, back into a native object of your programming language. So a Ruby object, put it in, uh, convert it into JSON, store it in CouchDB, and if you want to read that object again, you read the, the JSON out, convert it back to a Ruby object. Or if you do, like, inter well, I want to integrate different systems, you can deserialize it into a Python object or PHP or Java or any object in any language that supports JSON. And the nice thing about JSON, it maps naturally to all these uh, native types, again, numbers and strings, um, dictionaries and arrays or lists that, we, uh, that, that all programming languages share for some, at, some reason, uh, at some point. Um, Couch to be used to use XML, and we found that XML is a bit too verbose. It does more things that we would need for CouchDB. So, uh, well, we switched, switched to JSON, which is, is a, uh, like um, a better fit for what CouchDB does. Um, this is, I hope you can see all that. This is an example JSON document. Um, and you just, def it's basically just a list of keys and values. And values can be, again, either strings, numbers, there's an array there, and if booleans, um, and this is this is very simple to understand what that is. It's easy to read and write, and easy to parse computationally. So this is this is a very easy and simple thing. Um, you notice two like private properties, ID and rev. Um, when you store something in CouchDB, you get back an ID. That's that's the like identifier for that object. And if you give CouchDB that ID and ask for the data, it will give you the data you put in uh, previously. Um, so each each document in a docu in a CouchDB database will have will have a unique ID that you can uh, that can identify the data with. Um, the revision thing is uh, when you change things in a document, like you want to change the age, uh, you don't tell CouchDB <laughs> to inc increase the age by one or something like that, but um, you you create in your application a complete new document with the changed data and then give that to CouchDB and CouchDB saves this new document as the latest version, the newest revision or newest version of that document and maintains the, the old one. So the, the revision ID there would, be, would change for different uh, versions of a document and you would be able to uh, you make a change and decide there was a bad change, I want to undo it. You can take, okay, um, take the or ask for the previous revision or any revision and save that again as the latest revision. So there's a mini version control, versioning control system embedded in that, um, in catch to be there. Um, yeah, that's what I already said about uh, JSON. The other thing is um, the, the what, what I mentioned earlier with the, the application needing to spread all, out all the things into tables and, and, and reassemble all that. Again, it usually happens in some sort of object relational mapper or database abstraction or something. And with the step of we take objects, serialize them, and store them, there's this messy thing that usually doesn't scale and has other problems. That, that well, this, that makes our gray hair, a hair gray, sorry. Um, we just don't need that. We just do the serialization step, and we are done with the saving data. So that is, well, like a, a great simplification of things. Um, that is so far documents. Oh, one more thing: um, CouchDB documents can, like um, email, can have attachments. You can put in binary data, images, PDFs, associate that with a document. So you can organize things uh, nicely there. Okay, that, that's documents. Um, that. The next topic. Um, 
the way to talk to CouchDB is over HTTP, and we fully embrace this REST pr principle. That means everything in CouchDB, each document, is a resource. And <clears throat> we have these, the basic CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete, um, mapped onto the HTT HTTP methods, uh, put, delete, post, and the other one, uh, get. Um, and this is, is a very, very simple model. Everybody who knows HTTP um, and, or who works on the web di directly understands that you don't need to learn a new database driver or something. And every, um, every language or framework that supports HTTP already can talk to CouchDB. There's no, well, you don't need anything else there. And since everything that, that is kind of, kind of matters these days already does that, uh, or does understand HTTP, uh, that's uh, well. You can ca use CouchDB from everywhere, from your browser, from the command line, using curl, anything. That's um, again very simple, very easy to use. Everybody knows that. So there's there's no no very steep learning curve going on, and there's a lot of tool support. We have like the scaling HTTP or analyzing, having proxies, caching, all that is solved for HTTP, and you can just use that with CouchDB, which is a great advantage. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave you with that. Um, now we have a, I have a dump object store. We can just throw things in, get a key, and put the, ask for things that we saved under that key and have the nice revision thing. But that's really a dump, dump object store or data store. And <coughs> uh, the power of a database is usually that you can do calculations on, on the set of your uh, your data that you have in there, that you can manipulate them, sorting and all these, and that, would, that is what views are for. Um, with views, you can, you can define subsets of your data, get um, all the things that have like certain attributes. Um, you can do collation. If you need a certain order of things in your application, you can have views do that. And you can do aggregation, that is, um, Calcu make calculations based on the data that is in the in the documents. Make it counts, averages, all everything you need there. And um, the way way views are defined in CouchDB is they you create a special design document, and in that document you put two functions: a map function and a reduce function. That's where that map reduce comes in. Um, and I'll explain. I uh, have an example of map reduce in a second. Um, oh, what do you what you do with these, uh, you as the programmer provide uh, the map function and the view function. There, um, and CouchDB takes these, and when you query a view, that's just the basic terminology here, when you query a view, CouchDB executes the functions you provided, you don't actually execute the functions. And then CouchDB runs all the data through the function that returns your, the, the calculated result. And uh, here's a simple example of how that works. We have a database and a set of documents in there, and the first step is the map and the map thing. Uh, and what map does is it creates a list of keys and values. And <clears throat> in, in this case, we have like, ma messages, emails, and we tag them. And we want to create a nice tag cloud, and for that we need to know how often a single tag occurred in this, in our data. So uh, what the map thing does it, it just runs through all the data, all the documents we have, and just spits out all the tags we have. If, if a document has multiple tags, it puts multiple entries into the list, and as value, it puts out one, which is the count of the single occurrence of this tag, which sound weird at first, it's a bit strange, but that's how MapReduce works, and it becomes clear in a second. So what we have is a list of all tags that occur in our database, and all the counts for these single tags. <coughs> now, the reduce step, the left, left uh, list is what we just saw, reduce step on the reduce function gets for each key, we, we put out all the values and can then operate on the values that we have in the, in the map list on the left side. So what we just do for the, for the two tags that occur twice, we just sum up the values, which ends up being the count that's why, why we have that there. Ends up being the count of that tag in, uh, in our database. And this is a very, very basic example of how to do calculation. You can do really fancy things there um, to, to query everything you, you actually need. Um, since this is a programmer-centric uh, um, conference, there's code. 
And this is the map function. It's just uh, two and a half lines of code. Um, what, what happens when you query the view is CatchDB goes through, the, through a database and throws each document in the database into the, view, uh, into the map function. And now we have, it receives a doc argument, which is our document, and this document has an array uh, attribute that is called tags, and we just iterate over that one and emit, that's our internal function to create this list you just saw, um, with the name of the tags and the count of one, and that produces the list on the left. Now, the reduce function gets each key and an array of all the values, just like I just explained, and it lo just loops over the values and sums them up, returns the sum uh, for that key, and we get the right, the right list here. Uh, why do we do that? Uh, MapReduce um, is a concept that is um, parallelizable. That means the, each steps in between, and even, even the map, mapping and the reducing, can happen simultaneously on different machines. So if you have 100 million documents to, to count the tax and then have 10 machines running on, on <coughs> running on that calculation, that will be faster than on a single machine. And with MapReduce, we can distribute like uh, subsets of the keys and do, do parts of the calculation on each machine and then combine the result and return it. That is a very powerful mechanism and that's why Google is so rich. Um, so we, we thought that's a good idea to implement. Um, two more things about views. You probably cringed when I said when you query the view, CouchDB goes through all the documents in a database. Um, it does that once to create an index and each subsequent re request um, then reads this, uh, the intermediate result. It gets this, this uh, request gets cached. And if you change things in, in a um, CouchDB database, uh, views don't get changed directly on the, on the document change. You don't pay a um, view index creation penalty, but the CouchDB index or the, the view index get rebuilt when you query the view again. So there might be um, uh, happening a lot of reads and writes and, and deletes and whatever, and then the views just don't care. And when a view is queried the next time, only the changes that happened uh, in between the last time the uh, view was queried and now get, uh, get integrated into the index and returned. This makes a view index uh, creation, oh, well, the view, view looks look up very fast and very efficient, and the, the internal structure of CatchDB is uh, totally optimized to, the, uh, to this quickly recreating or updating uh, the indexes incrementally. Um, so that's, that's a very false operation here. Um, the other thing, so yeah, views are incremental, built on demand, and um, the reduce part is optional. So if you just want a list of all the tags, uh, even the duplicates, you'll just leave out the reduce function and get the list that the map, map function returns. If you want that, <laughs> that's uh, possible as so, uh, well. Um, and again, with the H going back to the HTTP interface, um, f each, each view has a, a, a URI in CouchDB, and you can, again, do the CRUD operations over um, HTTP, like with the get post put again there. So um, they are han handled in the same way as documents are handled. Um, so that's, again, very easy to use from a from programming perspective. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is replication. Um, the basic idea here is it's a good idea to have the data, your data with you. Well, we have internet access everywhere except when we don't and it doesn't work or it's slow or the data you have is too, just, you have, it's just too much data to, to send over the wire again or if you want to deliberately be offline, to not be like Twitter disturbed all the time. Um, so you would probably want to have the data with you. And the one, th one scenario there is... Um, you work for a like, big corporation, they have an internal, a huge internal customer database and all the, da the associated data in an application, and then you have a copy of that application on your notebook, and you'll be able to replicate this, the, the company's database onto your notebook or laptop. Uh, go to the client, that might be Apple and doesn't allow any like GSM or Wi-Fi or internet access there, and you're still, you're still able to use the application as if you would use the live database because you have a real, like, uh, yeah, a real copy of that database to work on. 
And what, what replication then allows you when you get back home is to synchronize the changes you made with that, that um, master database on your company. And in fact, the company might have a lot of representatives running around and all, they all can integrate the changes back to the master database. And all the changes that happen there then can go back to you so that you have the, the latest data. Um, this is like mm, uh, the one scenario there. The other ones are in a, in a web application. If you have a really cool database and uh, all the nice um, view, views and MapReduce and all this, um, if your hardware goes away for whatever reason, then your application is down and that just can't be. So you usually have multiple database servers to, um, to be safe against hardware failure. You will probably have more database servers if your if application gets bigger to spread load, read and write load. <clears throat> and replication there helps you to get all the instances of, of, your, of your database up to the same uh, level of data. So that can do like load balancing, failover things, and uh, obviously backup is, or of course backup is possible too with that. Um, and the way replication works is not like a, with the first scenario, it's not, there's no constant streaming of changes going on. It's more like an R-sync operation where there are two sets of data and um, the replication um, compares or creates a diff and then just moves over the, uh, just applies the diff to the, to the other um, database. So this is at, uh, on the, the same, has the same data than the other one. And this also, well, this just not works, and it's not only works with two nodes, but with any number of nodes. So, and, uh, with a MySQL replication, you usually have a master server that all the write requests to, or like a set of master servers, and then another battery of, of uh, read servers or, sl or slaves where all the reads go from. And with the CouchDB, you don't need to, to like, set up such a fragile system. You can have any number of master servers and have them replicate back and forth and have them eventually come up with all the same data. And this eventual consistency is, um, is a topic that Werner Fogels, the CEO of Amazon, uh, wrote a great paper about. I really encourage you to look into that one. Uh, that's the secret behind why Amazon is so massively scalable, that they don't force the upfront consistency that a um, relational database requires. So. Uh, CouchDB there. Um, well, uh, this paper was published after CouchDB was released, so there's no re relation there, but this is a very powerful concept that is used in practice and very successfully. Um, the, one, the one problem with, uh, with distributed replication is if two or more instances of your database get a change for the same document and then want to replicate, that's called a conflict. And Obviously, there's, that's a problem situation there. And what CouchDB does is that each node upon replication sees that there are so and so many changes that are in a conflict, and it chooses one of these conflicting versions to be the winner. And each node in, a, in this replication environment come up, comes up with the same winner. And they do that on their own. And there's a deterministic algorithm going on that for each node, uh, that each node can independently come up with the same uh, with the same winner that everybody else does without any group communication between the servers. So um, there's no if there's a network um, shortage or something or the network is slow in between. There's no we don't wait for everybody to agree on some winner, but we just pick the same one. And now what happens with the, with the versioning system well, that comes in handy there that I explained earlier. Well, like the the winning version gets saved as the latest revision of the document and all the losing revisions get saved as previous revisions. And the CouchDB then sets a flag at that document and says, okay, here's a, here's a conflict and that, that need, needs to be dealt with. And usually the application can decide what to do then. Um, like there's probably timestamping going on and you can see there's stale data here and we just throw that away. Or we see... Um, uh, the, the winner that was chosen is well, not the data we want to end up with, and we promote uh, one of the, the losing revisions to be the actual winner and resolve the conflict and have that replicated back of, uh, through our cluster. Yes, question? Uh, software, like in one document, one field is changed, another document, different fields is changed. Would it match together with, with one document? Yeah. The, 
question is if the question is if the replication is on the document level or on the field level. So if if there would uh, the, the, the change would be in different fields and two documents, would they be merged or would there still be a conflict? At the moment, there would still be a conflict. We might go to have like field or row level uh, um, conflict detection, but that's not in at the moment. Um, so where was I? Uh, with the conflicts. All right. Uh, the, uh, so most of the... Uh, uh, conflicts, or most conflicts can result automatically by the application. The user usually doesn't have to see any of that. But in case the application can, de can decide, can, uh, the, your application can show the user, okay, we have these, these documents or this data here, which one is the one you want to keep, and then resolve the conflict from there. That is uh, it's a pretty neat way of, of dealing with, uh, with, with this replication problem. And the idea is that... Um, your, your, no, or your cluster of, of databases has a consistent view of all, the of all your data so that the application can't ask two servers and get two different, uh, two different answers. Um, this, this consistency is uh, well, eventual consistency again that CatchDB, CatchDB has. Okay, that's replication. Um, the next one is build for the future. Uh, the databases we use today uh, were built, designed and built 20, 30 years ago. And the computing model back then was there's a scientist has a set of operations to run or calculations to run. He goes to this huge badass machine, uh, sits in front, types in his things, gets a result back, and the, the machine is built in the way and the software and the, the, the questions or the calculations are built in the way that the, the answers can come back as fast as possible so that the next scientist can come in and work on his problems because both the scientists and these machines are very expensive. Um, this is fundamentally different from how we use computers today. We, don't, we have lots of machines, lots of different C, uh, lots of CPUs, lots of cores per CPU, um, and we have 10,000 users hitting a single server at the same time. There's massive concurrency going on. And this is fundamentally different from how the databases we use today for these systems were designed and built. And I find it really, I don't know, it's a great accomplishment. I'm really, I, I, well, it's really astounding that these systems actually do work and can handle this, this load for, that they were not desi designed for. Um, and, oh, well, I'll, it's a... Oh, it's impressive, I find. And what CouchDB does, it, it acknowledges that we have this, this new hardware going on, that we use cheap hardware instead of huge machines, that we have multiple CPUs, that we have a lot of disk space, um, and that we have this more of this concurrent um, uh, usage model instead of the single and serialized usage model there. Um, programming is all about trade-offs. Uh, CouchDB trades disk space for data um, consistency, speed, uh, ease of use, and all that. Um, CouchDB is still reasonable with disk space, but that's the trade-off we take because disks are so cheap these days that we can waste a bit of that to, to have all the other cool things. Um, so what CouchDB does is, well, like I said, the relational databases are designed to execute the single query as fast as possible, as fast as hardware allows. And there goes a lot of thinking into designing your data model and the queries to get this as fast as possible resu result. Um, what CatchDB does is it actually has reasonable or pretty good performance for the single query, but the design idea that, is that it is optimized for is uh, the concurrency, all of your 10,000 users eventually, in a reasonable time, get a result, and not just 100 per second, but a really massively um, massive parallel load can be handled with that, with that database, instead of uh, just a couple of hundreds on a, on a big machine. Um, how does CouchDB do that? Um, CouchDB is written in Erlang. Erlang is a very cool programming platform. The language is a bit weird. Well, it's still nice. And, and um, Erlang was written by Ericsson. Ericsson is a telco company, and they have pretty unique... Well, they, it was developed in the late 80s and, and early 90s, and they had pretty unique, for the software world, uh, requirements 
for their software. That is, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, they need to be able, needed to be able to have or to handle a lot of concurrent telephone calls on a, th on a single piece of hardware. And in case there was a problem with one of those telephone calls, there might be a bug in the software uh, and there's, I don't know, a crash going on. Uh, this, this single problem cannot by no means affect any of the other calls that are going on. You cannot just drop the connections there. People will complain. I don't know. That just wouldn't work. It's not a model that, that is allowed there. And the other thing is you can't uh, or you, you, shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't need to um, take the machine offline to make, uh, create or to make a, a software update. Um, that means with Erlang you can have a machine running and have while it runs update the system, fix a bug and uh, this sounds a lot like amateur open heart surgery and it's really scary when you first, first hear it uh, but Erlang puts in um, a few mechanisms to ensure that nobody dies so this is actually a very cool thing and uh, this is a bit of number bragging but uh, that's, it's really impressive um, Ericsson sells this X AXD301 uh, telco switch, which they guarantee nine ninths of availability um, calculated per year. That is one thirtieth of a second per year guaranteed availability. I don't, uh, frankly, I don't believe that. I have no idea how they pull that off, but they sell it to you so they can guarantee it. It's really impressive. Um, and they do that with, the, with all the cool features of Erlang. <laughs> Um, how's that programming wise uh, in Erlang, oh, Erlang has, has this concept of very very lightweight processors and these processors are so they're a magnitude lighter or smaller and easier than POSIX threads for example so on this five year old trusty laptop uh, Erlang is able to spawn 10 to 15 thousand processors per second and dispose them again so they're very 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 small and being a functional programming language, uh, Erlang doesn't maintain a global state for, a, for your application. That means that there's one, one chain of processes can change some, some shared data that causes another one to crash. That's why thread programming is so hard. That just is not, is not in there. It's not allowed. So it's very, um, uh, very failure resistant. Um, the, way, the way it works, because we have these cheap processors, each module that, that is sort of like a class in, uh, in, in Erlang, <coughs> when, you, when you call a function in there, you actually send a message to another process. So all the function calls you do, or method calls you do in your application, are actually run in, in different processes inside of Erlang. And uh, you end up with this long call chain of processes. And now, if there's a problem in, in, in the current running <coughs> in, in instance of the, such a process, um, you, what, what you do usually in Erlang is just terminate this small process and report to the calling process, and it, it can then decide what to do. And it may decide to crash itself, and uh, we, you have this, this crash chain going on up to the ori original calling code. This greatly simplifies code because you don't handle errors. You just crash. Uh, you, like, you save like two-thirds of nasty error handling code. Um, you just crash your, your current train of processes without affecting any of the other things going on. So there might be a single problem somewhere crashing. And you still can serve the other 9,999 users in parallel uh, that you're, you're doing there, Erlang allows you to do that. This is, I could go on to praise Erlang for like hours. <laughs> well, I'll stop here. Um, uh, go to the other, other point. Um, the, the storage model of CouchDB, that is how bits and bytes actually get written to disk is, v is very, very clever. Um, first, uh, is it, it is asset compliant. That means basically your data is safe and secure and all that with your database once it says it has written the data. So that's basically uh, uh, one of these uh, basic things a database should do as asset compliant data. So I won't go into details here. Um, the other thing is that makes it so smart is the uh, MVCC or multi-version concurrency control. Um, that allows, uh, it's again for, this, for the concurrency going on. Um, when you 
when you have a data store and there's a read process and the write process going on at the same time. You don't want the read process to end up with half, half of the data that came in before, uh, was there before the write and half of the data that was in after the write. So that would be garbage. You don't want that, uh, obviously. And well, the basic way of doing or dealing with that is saying, okay, when there's a write, <coughs> we block everybody else uh, who wants to read or write until the write is done and then we, we let readers in again. Or if if anybody is reading, nobody can write it as long as they are. Well, at some point, there will be uh, the, the readers need to be blocked and all that. Um, and with the MVCC storage, and there comes the revisioning system uh, in again. When when you read a document in CouchDB, you only ever get to see this the, the the version that was current at the time you read it. When in the meantime, a new version is appended to the CouchDB database is added there. Um, <coughs> the reader just doesn't care about it. <laughs> it just it only gets to see the data that was current again uh, when it started reading, and also allows any number of parallel readers onto a data database. That means uh, as much as as your hardware permits, that, and everyone gets only the data that was current at the time they were they were starting to read. The only thing we need to be aware of is that document writes need to be serialized. We can only have one write happen at the same, at one time. And uh, yeah, that's like these, the writes get placed into a queue and worked off. And uh, the, 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 pro the possible or potential problem is here that your hardware is not fast enough to deal with all the writes coming in. But that's, that's the point where you need to partition the data out, of, uh, out to, di to multiple servers anyway. That's the same thing with any, any database. If you're like, the, the, the underlying hardware is just not, not powerful enough, you, need to, you just need more, <coughs> need more data there. Um, now, the way these, uh, yes, a question? I you know, you know, message queue concurrency to handle, handle things. And, you know, you that, that, question, that thing you just brought up, what would happen then if the queue did get full? What, what sort of mechanisms are in place in CouchDB? Um, uh, what would happen in case the right queue of CouchDB would get full and the, the, the hard... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm kind of trying to think of that. Um, I think what eventually... Uh, um, at some point, uh, RAM would fill with all the right requests that were stored, and the, the, the request time for, uh, the, the response time for this uh, write request would be, would just grow. And at the point when there's no more RAM to, RAM to, to, um, to take in more read requests, uh, write requests, the, the new write requests would just, would just uh, deny it earlier. Sorry? A lot of badness. Yeah, a lot of badness. But the way, um, the way CouchDB is designed is that, um, it um, it gracefully well if resources fill up it gracefully uh, declines um, accepting more more data and, and these things uh, and then waits until resources are available again without just crashing the whole database server so uh, when your application would detect that writes wouldn't get like handled in a snap I would see okay and then the application would say okay we have a huge server load we we gotta wait wait for a bit here uh, and show the user probably a waiting or just a temporary site to say, wait off until all these things can, can be flushed to disk again. So that would be, you would, you'd be able to monitor that and then eventually you would need more hardware to deal with your load. Another question. Uh, here's a new uh, node, whatever you're calling it, yes. on the fly, you know, like would that be something that's, have people done that? Like they monitor the uh, activity and then based on, you know, the load, Pop up, you know, well, the question is, have people done actual monitoring of a CouchDB database and then on demand popping up new nodes, handling new, uh, the, the write load or read load? Uh, not that I'm aware of. This is kind of a management of, of CouchDB thing. I haven't seen anybody doing that, but that's obviously a way to go. Yes. Um, one more thing about the data store, the way uh, the things, things get committed to disks ensure that after each write of, of a document, the entire database is in a consistent state. And if during a write your hardware happens to fail or power goes off and anything, um, your database is still in a consistent state. So when you restart CouchDB, when your hardware is back again, 
you don't need lengthy integrity checks running that should, could take hours on a reasonably sized database. CouchDB is up and running in no time again. Da data is always consistent on disk, uh, which, is, which is pretty neat if you know, if you ever deal with the MySQL problem. <laughs> um, so I won't, won't get into, I, I like to talk about the storage uh, engine a lot like I like to talk about Erling, but I keep it short in uh, favor of time here. <clears throat> Uh, we've got a few bonus features. Uh, in the end, people, actual people, will use your application. We people use natural language to communicate. We will, people will put natural language into your application and they will uh, want to search for that data using natural language search. Or natural language or full text search is not uh, a matter of comparing uh, lists of characters. Uh, there's, there's, more, there's linguistics involved and it's, it's a very broad field of, of research and practical things. And um, instead of doing that ourselves, we just leverage existing technology in Lucene um, as, a, as a framework to create full text indexes. And what CouchDB does is uh, just implements a full text mechanism that reads CouchDB documents and stores them into a full text index and then has a mechanism to query this full text index using the Lucene native query syntax. Um, this is set up in a way that if you don't happen to like Lucene or don't happen to like our version of Lucene, which is the Java one, you can plug in any search technology you want, whether it's Sphinx or there's a couple of other ones <clears throat> on the Mac that are Spotlight, you would be able to integrate that. So the actual full text search in engine you use is, is your, um, your thing to choose. One thing I forgot about to talk about, uh, tell about the views, I said we use JavaScript functions because they are a natural fit for, for the JSON data we have, um, you're actually able to change the query language there. So you could write your query, fun the map reduce functions in Ruby or Python or any other language and have CatchDB uh, work with that without uh, changing a lot of things if you don't happen to like JavaScript for that structure, uh, for that situation, for whatever, for your need. Um, Okay. Um, the other thing is JSearch, which is a research project from within IBM that's going to be open sourced. It's basically XPath for JSON, where you can like, query JSON structures and do do nasty things with that. We are um, we want uh, that's not actually in CouchDB at the moment, but this is uh, something we're really keen on getting in. Okay. Uh, a little bit of history. Uh, Damon Katz, this is the guy who came up with all the cool ideas and most of the implementation. <coughs> he used to work uh, for Iris, which is a consultancy for, that created Lotus Nodes for Lotus, which then got bought by IBM and is a, mm, I like, don't I think a tel ten, 10 billion per year enterprise for IBM, very successful. And Damien worked on the core, core database engine of Lotus Nodes, which is... Uh, in, in concept with the documents and the replication, very similar to what CouchDB has, so there's some uh, a leverage of ideas there. Um, well, Damien at some point said, fuck this, we, we need something better here. Uh, and he's, he, he, he quit his job, took his wife and his newborn daughter, went to, to a place near their families where it's cheap, cheaper to live, and lift off his savings for two full years to create CouchDB and release it as an open source project. I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> but it's, it's very, very impressive. So, um, yeah, uh, Damien's an amazing guy. Um, he's, he now works again for IBM. Uh, they hired him to work full time on CouchDB. And uh, this is set up in a way that there are actually no strings attached. We were recently accepted by the Apache, Fo Apache Found Software Foundation to become an Apache project, so we will be Apache CouchDB. And all the code Damien writes for IBM is obviously copyrighted by IBM, but they donate a copyright, <coughs> royalty-free and worldwide and all that, uh, to the Apache Software Foundation. So in case uh, the IBM loses interest in CouchDB and uses Damien for something else or fires him, all the things he did will still be in the open source project, CouchDB, so they, they didn't bind the software to them, they just hired the developer to work, to work with it. <clears throat> and we release on the Apache 2.0 license uh, now. And again, there are no strings attached. Um, uh, that's a good one. Anyway. Um, uh, 
I obviously didn't cover everything. I just uh, cr scratched the surface, and there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of things going on, uh, a lot of things to talk about CouchDB. And I'll be giving two CouchDB tutorials, like three-hour tutorials with programming examples and all that, uh, next month, in May and in June or July, forget, at uh, the XTech conference in Dublin, Ireland, and the Erlang Exchange conference in London. Uh, if you happen to be around and be interested or want to come up there, uh, you can read about that on my blog when, when these thing hap things happen, so you could sh uh, show up there. Uh, if you've got any other things you would know, there the, well, the slides will be online at some point. You just follow these links. Um, Damien's blog, my blog, the official CouchDB things. And the last link is uh, I gave a presentation at MailTrust two weeks ago, um, and they taped my... Uh, my presentation, they can see me giving the same talk only over two hours with a lot more, well, with a bit more technical detail, uh, if you like to. Um, you usually do a demo, but time is up now, so I signed up for a lightning talk, and if you want me to, I'll give a short, like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, need to I need to prepare, I couldn't do it now. So uh, we. Uh, Ah, I can give a, a sh short demo of, of a CouchDB distributed application in the Lightning Talks. Yes. Is there any concept of a transaction? Uh, the question is, does CouchDB <laughs> have the concept of a transaction? Yes, it has. That is, the transaction. The first is, a uh, document write or update happens or doesn't happen. So there's this single entity transaction, and you can uh, do multi-part post requests to send batches of data that succeed or doesn't, don't succeed. Uh, what it doesn't do is uh, like two-phase commit or uh, ensure that a, 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 a set of changes happen on multiple nodes. That would, you would need to implement that in your application. Um, also, uh, with the, with the multi-part post request you can do, there's, you can't put in a delete in there. So you would only have write operations. There are no delete operations in, in that transaction thing going on. This is the questions. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could talk about production status and maybe the oh, right. for the next few months. Yeah, uh, questions about production status. Uh, CouchDB at the moment, we label it as alpha software. And we mean, by, we mean uh, with alpha that we don't have all the features in that we want to have for 1.0. But there are systems running CouchDB at the moment that don't have any problems. So the the features that are in are pretty stable. We just don't have every, anything to call, uh, everything in. We wanted to call it a better or final release. And we want to have, and now that Damien's back working on it full time, uh, I think during summer we go into beta and then have a release sometime after that, how, how good, uh, depending on how good that goes. Question? Is it appended or is it a whole new thing for the And are the leads, the Okay, question is if uh, changes to, uh, to documents get appended inside the database, yes. So uh, you would, uh, instead of changing actual data on disk, we just append things to the database file. Is it a whole new record or is it just the diffs? It is a whole, it isn't, uh, the question is if it's a diff or a whole new record. It's a whole new record. We don't store the diffs. At some point, uh, I think we will have the ability that you send in diffs and calculate, case, uh, calculate the new revisions from that, but we don't have that at the moment. The other question is, if we do actual deletes uh, with this model, we don't. We just mark as delete, so uh, your database grows all the time, even if you delete data. And there's a process called compaction that runs per periodically that gets rid of all the uh, old revisions and deleted data eventually to, to gain hardware, uh, hard disk space back. That is where CouchDB wastes data in favor of speed and con uh, consistency. Yeah, sorry. Question? The view uh, implementation, how is it tied to the, to the JSON structure? Is it, is it a one-to-one -one mapping that says I have to have these fields in order to be able to map this view? Or is there some kind of typing that says if I see screens, I can put them in the view? Or okay, the question is how, how the JSON structure is tied to what you have in the views. Uh, when you create the view, uh, the map and reduce functions, you actually can define uh, a JSON object, again, with the fields you want to have eventually in the view. So you, you say you want a view with all the names and nicknames of all the persons. You would have, uh, would just emit uh, uh, 
a new a new um, JSON object that has has the structure you want to with all the data in it, and then when you query the view, you get this predefined object back with the with the data in it. If I have to find a view for something, is there any way for me to look up? How, how will it, is there a way to look up? Or do I have to define a view in order to see data? Oh, uh, do you have to do um, define a view in order to see data? Uh, not if you obviously not if you request single documents, but if you want to do want to have ranges of documents, you create a view. Uh, if you're familiar with relational databases, think of a view as uh, index on a column. Have as many views as you want uh, for all the data you need to get out. Okay, that was another question. Uh, specifically for Ruby, I've kind of looked at the API. It seems pretty straightforward how to use it. The only part I can't quite figure out is how you register the. Um, and, uh, with okay, the question is how to actually create a view, put it, how do you put it in the, the map and reduce functions into CouchDB. Uh, we have this uh, the, uh, thing we call design documents that are just documents that have a special URL that then CouchDB recognizes to be uh, a view definition document. And you put the, the, the literal code, the JavaScript code for those functions into this document, and they have to have a certain structure for that. And you can find examples on the couchdbwiki.com. Uh, and then couchdb sees that as a view and applies, reads this document and applies these functions from there. A question over there, yes. Uh, it, it, okay, the whole thing about um, you know, RDBMS versus just storing data. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was, is it reasonable to see couchdb as an object database that just happens to use JSON? Uh, question is if CacheDB is just an object database that happens to use JSON. I uh, must admit I'm not too familiar with what 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 is called object or object oriented databases. Uh, we obviously don't uh, have all the full fledged features that OO features. We just store objects into CacheDB. So I don't know. Oh, well, what we call oh, Damien called CacheDB a document based or document database. So that's that's a bit different there. Like what's what's the why 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 do you want to use a document database instead of RDBMS? Okay, why why would you want to use a document database instead of RDBMS? I should say, uh, CouchDB is not meant as like a silver bullet thing that solves all your problems. There are situations where a relational database is just the perfect fit because the model of your data just naturally fits uh, this relational data. But it happens to be that most data we use in the real world is not relational. And there's an artificial thing going on to transform that to fit on that relational model. And you can then probably decide um, if that model fits your data. Um, and my, the most of the data we use, like the business card, the, the business card receipts example, that's all the data we, we use in the, real, in the real world. And there's no like on my business card is no pointer to the actual data that gets updated when I change my address. Well, there's, it is printed on the thing and can get outdated. And people might end up with, both, with old revisions of my, my business card that are no longer valid. And somehow we can deal with that as people. So this concept is just applied to, to the database store. OK. More questions? Yes, please. So a question on replication. Does each database have to have the full data? Like in your example of uh, in a business, then you can have a, a client application that has all the data. What if you have data in your database that shouldn't be accessible to all users? A uh, question about replication if all the nodes must have all the data. At the moment, yes, but we will, you will be able to define replication on a view level. So you would say, I would be able to say, I replicate only the data that is in this view or all the documents that match this view so that you can send only a subset of the data to a replicating database. Also, security, I didn't talk about that, will be, uh, will be implemented in that way that you have, uh, have a mechanism to say uh, this set of documents is not allowed to be read or read by this, this sort of users. As, again, that's not in at the moment, but uh, uh, that's how it's going to work. Got a question? What was his question? I, I didn't, was, uh, must, must each database have... Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, must be. If you have a, 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 at what point? 
Yeah, if you, if you have a, a, like a, a company internal application and then you have a client application, and the client application obviously shouldn't have all the data from the company application, but just a subset of that. So if you have like a database with, with confidential information and only want to, want to have a subset of that for the client, so if, would, you, would it be able to just replicate a subset? I think that was your question. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, could you touch on security? No. <laughs> uh, the question is if I can touch on security. I would love to, but there's no built-in security in CouchDB at the moment. Uh, we will have a full-fledged security and authentication system where documents have users and you can validate documents on rights, so you have certain uh, ways to enforce some sort of structure and documents that don't match that are get re rejected for rights. Um, and we read and write uh, um, permissions and all that. Well, that's at the moment not in. So you would, uh, if you would run run CatchDB, uh, it would be behind some sort of proxy layer thing that is not actually exposed to to a user. Yes. Are the views intended to be used across the homogeneous data set, or can they be used different uh, schemes? Uh, the question is if CatchDB views can be used for should be used, can or should be used. Is, is there an assumption that, that every every object is the same? Or okay, but this is uh, do well, uh, for a document uh, do all documents need to be the same to be in the same view? No. This is uh, um, you can uh, like for example you have an address book application and you decide to have a name field and and all the other fields. And at some point you want to split it into first name and last name. Uh, so you have a doc, uh, an old document set that has just a name field, and your application would read a view that has a name field. And now the new uh, new database of uh, the new documents have a field uh, in first name and last name field. In the view, what you could do is, f for this object that you store in the view, you could concatenate the first and the last name and return that as the name, so that your application can still use it. So. so uh, views are one way to aggregate this sem semi-structured data. Yes. Uh, are there plans to include something uh, similar to, to SQL triggers in the future? Oh, uh, the question is if there are plans to uh, add something like triggers in SQL databases. Uh, we have that. Uh, there is a mechanism in CatchDB that you can register a standalone daemon that you would need to need to write uh, that gets an update notification each time a, docu uh, a database gets changed, and that's actually the way full text indexing uh, works already. So uh, you could could get notification each time there's a change in your database, and then act on that notification. That already works. Good. Another question. Uh, any plans for like integrating it with the browser, like Google Gears? Uh, or, or is the preferred model for the yeah, the, like the, the question is if there's any plans to integrate with a browser like Google Gears. Uh, that we are not the ones to talk to that. That would be the browser vendors, or that would be a perfect usage model for CouchDB. Um, integration with client. That will show that in the demo, since uh, it's an HTTP API, and you can put um, uh, HTML documents inside. CouchDB document attachments that have a unique URI, you can query this uh, attachment inside a browser, have a, have a web page rendered there, then have AJAX calls talk to CouchDB, so you can have a full-fledged application served and running from CouchDB uh, without any middleware. So there, there's another usage model there, which obviously you, you don't want to do in, like, <laughs> without the security stuff going on. Uh, but for internal applications, well, these, this is already possible. And we do, CouchDB comes with an uh, uh, administration program that works that way. That's just a J, jQuery Ajax website thing where you can administer your, your CouchDB. Another question. I had a follow up question. Um, what, if, what if it's not business cards you're just storing? What if it's <laughs> different types of data? Do, do you tell the data types? Uh, the question is you determine the data types from the URI? Um, Question is if if I have, happen to have multiple data types, not only business cards, uh, there's no way to force you to do that. Uh, each document can have a different structure, and there's no way to tell up front un unless you query the object, uh, query for the for the document. Uh, 
and we are still developing best practices, working with CouchDB. One thing would be have a type field that would would tell your application which type uh, of, object, of of document you put in there, and if there if if it's a business card, have a view, have all these in a view that lists all the people, and if it happens to be I don't know, inventory or just all computers in the in the company, there would would be a different type. So you could do that, or you could. Uh, um, do you could query on the structure of of, uh, of a document? So if you know there, I don't know if there's a field um, person or a, a key person in this document, then you know it is a it is a business card entry. And if there's field inventory, um, regardless of its data, you can so you can could do queries on the structure of your documents to determine which type it is. Well, there's, there's, it doesn't enforce it. Well, obviously, you, you would want, uh, <clears throat> would want to have some, some sort of mechanism there. Right, the one thing is, uh, we will have uh, um, validation functions. They were just functions you provide, like with the MapReduce functions, and that will be applied on write. And so, if you would, and it could check if. Uh, if you write this document and it doesn't, the, the validation function doesn't return true, so it can check for certain structure for, for certain things to be there. If it doesn't allow the actual write to happen, the write gets rejected to the user, so you can enforce some schema there if you want to, but you don't have to. Also, that's not in at the moment, but we will have that. Good. Yes, another question. Uh, this is a time frame for one point uh, oh, like I said, we <coughs> now have a better going on in summer, and then depending on how how, th how things go, have a one point oh sometime after that. Okay. Um, if you've got any other questions, want to ask later, they pop up later. Just just grab me in the hallway or anyway uh, anywhere. Send me an email. I don't know. Just talk to me. I'm here. Thanks. <laughs>